I'm going to ask this question. Y'all know what I preached on last week? Do you remember? What? Fear of God. Good. Thank you. Fear of God. And remember, we went to Luke chapter 12. Here's what we said. If we're going to stand for Jesus in these last difficult days, you've got to have two things. Fear of God and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Y'all remember that last week? Fear God more than people and, um, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So this is kind of part two uh, of, uh, of from last week's sermon. And let me just say this. I'm talking to men and women today. Fellas, let me just tell y'all this. I have met multiple ladies in this church and outside this church, godly Christian ladies who say, I can't find a Christian man. I can't find a man who treats me right, is truly masculine, and stands boldly. So if you're a single Christian man, if you'll just be bold and strong and a godly man, you, you, you can find a, a good godly lady, okay? And you, don't, you can be ugly. You can be an ugly guy and that's why. Now look, if you're hideous, I can't help you, okay? But, you know, as long as you're res, you know, relatively good looking, whatever. All right, so, but our world really does respect people who stand for what's right. They may not agree with you, but at least they respect you. I was reading a story one time of Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright was a frontier evangelist in the Second Great Awakening. And I love this guy. He was a tough, no-nonsense evangelist. And he was preaching one night at a, uh, a frontier church. And the deacons, before, before he preached, came up. They're all excited. He said, what are you so excited about? They said, Andrew Jackson is going to be in our service tonight. Now, this is before Jackson became president, but he's a general. Everybody knows he's going to be president. He's kind of like the celebrity. So they say to Peter Cartwright, look, we know sometimes when you're preaching, you get a little carried away, you get a little insensitive, so could you just tone it down tonight since we got Andrew Jackson? And he just kind of smiled and, and nodded his head. And so uh, when Peter Cartwright got to preach, here's how he started his message. He said, I have been told that Andrew Jackson is here tonight in our presence. I have also been asked by the deacons to tone it down since Andrew Jackson is here tonight. So let me just say this. If Andrew Jackson doesn't repent and get saved, he's going to be damned to hell just like everybody else. <laughs> and afterward, Andrew Jackson went up to Peter Cartwright and he said, Sir, with a regiment of men like you, I could defeat this whole world. Isn't that great? I want you to look at Daniel chapter 3. Because in Daniel chapter 3, something very interesting happens. Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful man in the world. Okay? He is the global dictator, most powerful man in the world, and he's also a psychopath. And just south of Baghdad on the plain of Dura, to probably consolidate his power with all these different people he had defeated, he sets up a statue. And here's what he says. We set up a statue, and there could have been thousands, there could have been tens of thousands there. He said, when y'all hear this music play, everybody must bow down to the statue. If you don't, y'all see that furnace over there? I'm going to throw you in that furnace, and I'm going to burn you alive. Now, incidentally, Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, is a foreshadowing of the coming world leader that we know as the Antichrist. Nebuchadnezzar was the first global Gentile king. The Antichrist will be the last global Gentile king. Nebuchadnezzar sets up an image to worship. In Revelation 13, the Antichrist demands global worship. Uh, the, the image that Nebuchadnezzar sets up has two sixes in it. It's 60 cubits by six cubits, 60 and six. The final Antichrist will set up an image and somehow it's connected to three sixes, 666. Six, six. And this is an eerie, grotesque statue. It's 90 stories tall, nine feet wide. It's a weird, grotesque statue. And in fact, the music that is sounded, scholars who study Daniel chapter three and say, they studied the instruments. They said, these instruments, they don't go along with each other. It's some kind of weird, demonic, cacophonous sound. And so the music sounds and thousands bow. Again, maybe tens of thousands bow. Except for three young men. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
And these young men actually have an interesting past. They had been uh, born and raised in Jerusalem, in Judea. And when the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C., Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with thousands of others, were transported to Babylon. They were basically kidnapped and transported to Babylon. Okay, And what they did in Babylon is they said, we need help ruling this big empire. So we're going to take some of these captives, and we're going to try to find the sharpest ones we can. And we're going to take them out of that captive group, and we're going to start a governor's school. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to that governor's school. And there probably was, some scholars say, maybe 100 in all young Jewish men who went to that governor's school. Okay, And that's who these guys are now. They were kidnapped when they were teenagers. Now they're probably in their 20s. And these are the ones who will not bow to the golden image. You need to understand this. Nebuchadnezzar and that wicked Babylonian culture was trying everything they could to corrupt those young men. And whether you know it or not, the Bible says that there is a system. The Bible calls it the cosmos, the world. There is a system that is trying to corrupt you, your family, and your young people. And how does that system try to corrupt us? Several ways. Jot this down. First of all, they try to do it through indoctrination. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, did you know that's not their given name? Their given Jewish names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Hananiah means Yahweh is a gracious God. Mishael means who is like my God, the real God. Azariah means Yahweh is my helper. Well, they changed Hananiah's name to Shadrach, which means under the command of Aku, the moon God. Meshach means who is as Aku, the moon God. Abednego means servant of the God, Nebo. Do you see what they're trying to do? They're trying to remove any vestige of their godly worldview and replace it with a pagan worldview. And they're doing the same thing to your kids today. They're trying to replace their godly heritage with an ungodly heritage. They are indoctrinating your kids, and they are succeeding. They have indoctrinated your kids to the point where your kids think that a man by fiat can suddenly say, I'm a woman, and poof, he's a woman. It doesn't work that way, and we're the science deniers. That's crazy. It's indoctrination. Pastor, you're just trying to brainwash our youth. I am. I want to wash their brains in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to give them a Christian worldview. That's what we're trying to do. Because you need to understand this. Somebody is going to indoctrinate your kids. Either you are going to indoctrinate them into the Word of God, or the world's going to indoctrinate them. No, 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 Pastor. We're just trying to teach them to think for ourselves. We don't try to indoctrinate them. We want them to think for themselves. No, you don't. If you let a young person think for himself or herself, and as, as she thinks or he thinks for himself or herself, and they develop a Christian worldview and they turn into a conservative pro-life, you think the world's going to allow that to happen? They ain't going to allow that to happen. We want them to think for themselves as long as they end up just as pagan as we are. That's what they tried to do. Indoctrination, secondly, second attempt to corrupt them was isolation. Chapter 3, verse 7 says that, you know, basically tens of thousands of people, they say, okay, we'll, we'll bow down, and they all bow down to the God, the golden God, and yet these three don't. Now, here's my question. If scholars are right, and there were 100 Jewish young men in that Jewish governor's school, they were there that day. What happened to the other 97? Why did only three stand up? Here's what the world wants you to think. You are the only person that thinks this way. You are the only person at school who has these values. You are isolated. That's what the world wants you to think. In fact, it's amazing how sometimes I'll be preaching and I'll say something that really is not, now it's controversial today. It, it, it wasn't controversial years ago, but now it's controversial, things like whatever. And people will come up to me, they always say this, Pastor, thank you for saying that. Well, you're welcome. And then they say this, I thought I was the only person who felt that way. Have you had that experience before? When you suddenly find out you're not the only person who thinks this world has lost its ever-loving mind, you're like, wait, I'm not the only person who thinks this way. Others think this way as well. But see, the world tries to isolate you and make you think you're the only one that follows the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of y'all are wimping out because of that. We used to sing an old song. You know, we, you know, we lie all the time in church. The biggest way we lie are the songs we sing. Remember we used to sing this song 
Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Maybe we ought to start singing that again because I want to get to the point where I don't care if the other six billion people on planet Earth go the other way, I'm still following the Lord Jesus Christ. So they corrupt them through indoctrination, through isolation, and then through intimidation. Hey, y'all don't bow. You don't toe the line. I'm throwing you into the fiery furnace. We're having to deal with the same thing today. We have to say to our kids, conservative kids, maybe you need to go back and take that off of Facebook because if a potential employer sees that you voted for that person, if a potential employer sees that you have that value, you may not get hired. What's the world doing? It's intimidating us. Same thing. Um, my daughter is good friends with, y'all remember the bring back our girls thing, the, the 200 girls that were kidnapped by Boko Haram a few years ago, y'all remember that? My daughter's friends with one of those girls. The Muslim group went to this village, kidnapped all these Christian girls, took them hostage, and uh, w- some of them escaped. They jumped off the truck and, um, and they ran through the jungle and my, my daughter is friends with one of those ladies. And uh, these are teenage girls. They're brought back to this Muslim stronghold and they are told you can either convert to Islam or you can be killed. One girl named Monica refused to convert. She was stoned to death. I read an interview with her father, who's a Nigerian pastor, a very soft-spoken man. And here's what he said, quote, I was told that my daughter refused to change her religion. I was told that they dug a hole and buried her up to her neck, and then they stoned her to death. Then he said this, To die for the sake of Christ, that's the happiest thing for me. I am grateful that she didn't change her religion. She trusted in God to the very end. That's intimidation, and she didn't bow. So how is the world trying to corrupt our young people? Indoctrination, isolation, intimidation, and then jot this down, subjugation. Do you know what I mean, subjugation? It means you can't have any varying different opinions. You gotta toe the line. Every knee must bow. Everybody has got to be in agreement. That's subjugation. And you see this here. I mean, here's the thing. Let's say it was like tens of thousands of people who bowed. Nebuchadnezzar, three out of tens of thousands, that's pretty good. Just let it go. Nebuchadnezzar says, no, I'm not going to let it go because every knee has got to bow. I read this past week in the book of Esther. There's an anti-Semite named Haman. The emperor elevated him and says, everybody bow to him. And so everywhere he goes, Every knee bowed, every knee, every knee, every knee. Except there was one man, a God-fearing Jew named Mordecai that wouldn't bow his knee. Now, if I were back, I said, hey, hey Haman, just let it go. Everybody else is bowing to you. It's just one person, just let it go. And he said, no, every knee has got to bow. Every knee. Hey, there are other wedding venues who believe in gay marriage. I'll give you the number. Would you go ask them? No, no. Every knee has got to bow. There are other bakers who will bake a stupid wedding cake. No, every knee has got to bow. There are other florists you can use. I don't care. Every knee has got to bow. That's subjugation, and that's the world that we are living in right now. And so, beloved, I'm just telling you, this is not just for several thousand years ago. This is for today. Look, this is happening right now. I'm not, look... Okay, I'm not a conspiracy guy. I'm not a cons- I believe Oswald acted alone. I'm not a conspiracy guy. But I'm just telling you, it's getting crazy out there, and I don't trust them. I don't trust the media. I don't trust our Lord and Savior, Anthony Fauci. I don't trust any of them. There's something going on that just doesn't make sense to me. And in fact, now I gotta be really, really careful here, okay? Because Pastor Chris is gonna preach for me next week and I don't wanna blow things up and he has to clean up my mess. So I'm, just, I'm gonna choose my words carefully. This is not theoretical. Even this past week, we as a church were targeted by a government institution because of our conservative beliefs. Now, we're gonna work through it. I'm sure they're gonna come to their senses. Everything's gonna be all right. But here's what I wanna say to these government people. Hey, don't put that in if you're going to target us from our beliefs, at least don't put it in writing, okay? You, gotta, you can talk about that behind our backs at your office or whatever, but don't, <laughs> it's illegal to put that in writing. But anyway, we'll work through it. But I want you to understand, this is happening right now, okay? Pastor, does it bother you? Now, this is where I get really weird, okay? 
To me, it doesn't bother. This is so exciting. Isn't it exciting? I don't want to live in boring 1950s Christianity where everybody went to church, everybody loved Jesus, everybody watched Andy Griffith, everybody was great, everything was great. I don't want to be like that. I mean, I want to, I want to fight for the Lord Jesus Christ and get involved in some stuff and do something for the kingdom of God, don't you? I don't like boring Christianity. I don't believe in violence. We're not into violence. We're not into that kind of stuff. But I look, of all the days, listen, of all the epochs and eras that you could have been born in, God chose to let you be born right here, right now, because he wants you to do something significant for the Lord Jesus Christ. These are exciting days to live in, honestly. In fact, I love that great uh, Winston Churchill quote. (laughs) Churchill said, there's nothing more exhilarating than to be shot at without effect. There's nothing more exhilarating than to be in the middle of the battle and stand strong. It's, 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 it's exhilarating. Well, how do we stand for Jesus Christ as things are getting crazier and crazier out there? Well, I want you to look at Daniel 3, verse 16, because I'm going to say the same two things that Jesus said last week. You want to stand for Jesus Christ? You fear God more than people, and you be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not rocket science. It's as easy as it. You fear God more than people, and you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, okay, play this up in your mind. Here's our problem with reading the Bible. We don't have imagination when we're reading the Bible because we already know how the story ends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't know how the story ends. So you got, let's imagine, three 20-year-old boys that are brought before the most powerful dictator in the world. This is the, this is the biggest celebrity in the world. And he's, he's mean and he's vicious and they're brought before Nebuchadnezzar. And listen to what they say, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from you and your hand, O king. But if not... Let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed short, towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Have you ever met somebody like that? They get so angry, their whole face just kind of changes. That's what happens to him. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other uh, other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed the men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Do we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Well, look, he said, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Who do you think that was? Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whom, whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not even on them. Isn't that great? And you see those two things right here. First of all, they feared God more than they feared Nebuchadnezzar. I like verse 16. L- listen, they answered uh, and they said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. You know literally what they were saying to the most powerful man in the world? Nebuchadnezzar, this ain't up for discussion. We're not bowing before your gold image. Now, we're not going to go to Starbucks, order some lattes, let's sit, let's talk about our different worldviews. No, this isn't up for discussion. We fear God more than we fear you. We're not discussing this. We're not bowing to your stupid idol. That's basically what they said, okay? Would to God that we have more people like that in the church of Jesus Christ. This says this ain't up for discussion. I know what marriage is. I know what the Bible says. I'm not discussing this. 
You see, well, that's the thing. We all think we need to sit down and we need to kind of come to some compromise. We need to kind of be maybe a little bit more middle of the road. Can I tell you something? The only thing I've ever seen in the middle of the road was dead and it stunk. We need to say, I know what the Word of God says and I'm sticking to the Word of God. They feared God more than man. And then secondly, remember what Jesus said last week in Luke 12? You gotta fear God more than people and you gotta be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, I want you to look there at verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. Well, look, he said, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Here's what some of y'all are saying. Hey, if I had that fourth person walking around with me, I wouldn't be scared. You tell me to go out and stand in the midst of the fire. Well, they had that fourth man walking around. I could stand for Jesus in this culture if I knew that fourth man was walking beside me. Hey, newsflash, he is walking beside you. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. That fourth man is still walking around. Because you need to understand this. We believe in how many gods? One. That one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you know what the Holy Spirit's job is? The Holy Spirit's job is to mediate, that is to bring the presence of God down to you. The Holy Spirit is God's presence with you. That fourth man is walking with you. He is with you in that fire right now. In fact, Jesus put it this way, John chapter 14, verse 16, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you. For how long, church? Forever. Verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be with you. And when you start to understand that, listen to me, when you start to understand that the presence of the Holy Spirit is with you everywhere you go, some kind of godly, supernatural boldness wells up in you. In fact, have you ever studied a concept and after you study, you're like, I think God is trying to take us by the shoulders and shake us and say, listen to me, because this concept is all over the Bible. Somebody said one time, uh, there are 366 um, Fear nots in the Bible. Fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. One for every day of the year plus leap year. There are all these fear nots in the Bible. Have you noticed before? Many times God will say, fear not. Why? Because I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you. Over and over and over again. It's like God is saying, church, I love you. Y'all are reasonably smart people. I'm just trying to tell you this over and over again. Don't be afraid. Why? Because my presence is with you. And when we saw that last week, look at the Luke Chapter 12, verse 12. Jesus has just said, y'all got to stand for me and be bold. He said, the, the religious people are going to come after you. The political people are going to come after you. And then all the other world powers are going to come after, you know, Hollywood and uh, the educational system, all that. They're all going to come after you. And Jesus says, when they come after you, verse 12, the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you should say. The who? The Holy Spirit. Here's another one. Matthew chapter 10. You will be arrested. You will be scourged. You will be brought before the world leaders. Some of y'all say, wait a second. Well, then why should I follow Jesus Christ if Jesus is promising you will be arrested, beaten, and scourged? Why? Because you get Jesus. They can scourge me all they want. I get Jesus, and so I come out on top. In fact, we like these, these Bible promise things. You know, some of y'all have a calendar, a precious Bible promise for every, every day. Can, can I tell you a precious Bible promise you never have on those old calendars? Here's one. All those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Y'all want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus? Do you want to live a godly life? In Christ? Then you're going to be persecuted. That's going to happen. And so Jesus says in Matthew Chapter 10, look, when you're arrested and scourged and brought before world leaders, don't worry about how to respond or what to say because God will give you the right words at the right time. Listen to this. For it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. Isn't that great? 
there again, Holy Spirit, boldness to stand for Jesus Christ. Here's another one, Acts chapter four, verse eight. Peter is talking to the same men who just a few months before had Jesus arrested, beaten, tortured, and killed. And they're gonna do the same thing to Peter if he's not careful. And Peter does not hold back. I would kind of forgive Peter if he maybe shrunk back a little bit. No, no, it says in Acts chapter four, verse eight, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and he just puts them in their place. Filled with the who? Holy Spirit. Acts chapter four, verse 31. The church is facing persecution. They're coming at the church. They're now getting some grief because they're following the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church didn't huddle together and say, oh God, please, please put a Republican back in the White House so the, the persecution will quit. Oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ, please make the bad guys stop being bad guys. Please make the demons get saved and they'll be nice to us all of a sudden. They don't pray that. Here's what the church prays when they're going through persecution. Acts chapter four, verse 31. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they speak the word of God with boldness. If you read that chapter, there's God. Listen to their threats and let your people speak forth your word with boldness. And it says right there, God filled them with the who? The Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word with boldness. Do y'all see the pattern here? I fear God more than man. And I understand that God is with me. That fourth person in the furnace is walking with me. I am filled with the Holy Spirit and I have boldness. Let me give you one more. The Apostle Paul is standing before a powerful world leader that can have him killed. And it says in Acts 13 verse 9, Then Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, said over and over and over again, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, does this make sense? Y'all just kind of stare at me. Does, does this make sense? I'm just telling you, it's getting crazy out there. And I love y'all, but you're not that good. You and I cannot stand for the Lord Jesus Christ in that messed up culture without the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. I need him, you need him, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you start understanding the fear knots, don't be afraid, why? Because I'm with you. Fear not, why? Because I'm with you. When you're called before HR because you won't toe the line, I am with you. When you're denied tenure because you won't compromise, I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. When you understand the presence of the Holy Spirit is with you and in you, it just changes everything. In fact, I don't, I don't share this story. I've sh shared this before, and some of you are thinking, why are you sharing some of the same um, illustrations you've shared before? I, I shared this in about three years ago. I just looked it up. I shared it three years ago. And the reason I'm sharing some of the same stuff is, number one, we got so many new people here that they've not heard these stories before. That's number one. Number two, I'm not creative, and I gotta keep using the same stories over and over again. And number three, I, I like this story, and I think it proves my point, so listen to this. This man said, uh, many years ago, I was walking in Newport Beach, a beach in Southern California, with two friends. Two of us were on staff together at a church, and one was an elder at the same church. So you got it? Two pastors, elder, walking along Newport Beach. So we walked past a bar where a fight had been going on inside. And that fight had spilled out into the street, just like an old, like an old John Wayne Western movie. Several guys were beating up on another guy and he was bleeding from the forehead. The, the, the three of us, we knew we had to do something. So we went over there to break up the fight. He says, I don't think we were very intimidating. You know, a couple pastors and elder, they go over there and here's what they said to break up the fight. Hey guys, cut it out. Okay, that's it. Hey guys, cut it out. Didn't do much good. They kept beating up on the guy. Then all of a sudden, they looked at us with fear in their eyes. The guys who had been beating up on the one guy stopped and started to slink away. I didn't know why until we turned and looked behind us and out of the bar had come the biggest man I think I've ever seen in my life. He was something like six feet, seven inches, maybe 300 pounds, maybe 2% body fat. He's just huge. We called him Bubba. Not to his face, but behind his back later on, we called him Bubba. Bubba didn't say a word. He just stood there and flexed his muscles. You could tell he was hoping the guys would try to have a go at him. And all of a sudden, as those guys were walking off, my attitude was transformed, and I said to those guys, yeah, and you better not let us catch you coming around here again. <laughs> I was a different person. 
because I had a great big Bubba standing beside me. I was ready to confront with resolve and firmness. I was released from anxiety and fear. I was filled with boldness and confidence. I was ready to help somebody that needed helping. I was ready to serve where serving was required. Why? Because I had a great big Bubba standing beside me. I was convinced that I was not alone. I was safe. If I were convinced that Bubba were with me 24 hours a day, I would have a fundamentally different approach to my life. If I knew that Bubba was beside me all day long, you wouldn't want to mess with me. But he's not. I can't count on Bubba. And again and again, the writers of Scripture pose this question for us. How big is your God? And again and again, we are reminded of the one who is greater than Bubba that has come. And you don't have to wonder whether or not he'll show up. He is always there. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to live your life in hiding. You have a great big God, and he's called you to do something great. So get on with it. I'm saying to you, the God of the universe is with you wherever you go out there. In fact, I want you to stand with me right now because here's what I want us to do. I don't know about you. Uh, we had yesterday our membership class. We had like um, 140 people show up for membership classes. Isn't that great? And I told them this yesterday. You were talking about the baptism of the Spirit. I said, I don't just believe in the baptism of the Spirit. I believe in baptisms of the Holy Spirit. And I get filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'm a leaky vessel. I just need a fresh refilling of the Holy Spirit. Anybody else here in this place? I need the boldness of the Holy Spirit. I need to be reminded that He is with me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And for a few moments this morning, I want us to pray for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Hey, here's the new pastor. What do I do? What are the five steps to being filled with the Holy Spirit? There's only one. Jesus said, how much more will your Father give the Spirit to them that? Ask. You just ask Him. So we're going to sing and we're going to worship for a few moments. And then we're going to ask the Father for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Are y'all with me on this? And so let's worship for the next few moments. And then I'm going to pray and we're going to just receive a fresh infilling of that Holy Spirit. Make it lead us right now. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Yeah. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence lord holy spirit yes holy spirit you are and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord holy spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the And I want you right now in the presence of God just to pray this prayer. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Can you pray that right now? Father, fill me afresh and anew with your Holy Spirit. God, I'm dry. God, I'm weak. God, I'm going through the fire. Fill me again with your Holy Spirit. Pray that right now. Pray that right now, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I need you to pray that right now. God, I need a fresh 
infilling of your Holy Spirit right now. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that that same presence who's with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will come upon your people right now and fill them again, Lord God. We need your Holy Spirit. We need your presence. Spirit of the living God, flow into us right now. We cry out, Father, give us the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. How am I going to ask you to do that in your own words? Just pray and say, God, I need, I need the fresh and filling of your Spirit. Presence of the Spirit of the living God. Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Just cry out to God right now. Just, I, I know we probably need to leave, but I, I want to do this for a few more moments. Father, 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 Father. God, fill us with your spirit right now. We are hungry for your presence. We are hungry for your spirit. Hey, Megan, lead us in that one more time. Sing, sing that again to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our to be overcome by your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be Hey, church, church, God says the same thing to Joshua. Joshua's about to go fight demons, fight giants, push back the forces of darkness, expand the kingdom of light. And God says, Joshua, why are you afraid? I'm going to be with you everywhere you go. And I'm saying to you, you leave this place to fight demons, fight giants, push back the forces of darkness. God's going to be with you everywhere you go. So I say to you the same thing that was spoken over Joshua right now. You receive this from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance to you and give you shalom, peace, wholeness. And I also say to you, Chazach ve'ematz. Ata wrote for Arhet, Heimcha Adonai Elahecha, behold, Esha Tehelach, which means be bold. Y'all be strong. Don't be afraid and don't be terrified of anything because the Lord your God is going to be with you everywhere you go. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, beloved. Let's go change this world for Jesus Christ. God bless you.